All right. Good morning. Looks like I had a little bit of technical issues here and thought I was going live when I wasn't. Imagine that. So not like we ever have technical issues around here. So this is me. This is what we're doing today. We are talking diversity, inclusion, and careers. And it is going to be from my point of view. And I will tell you why in a moment, because that's going to be kind of our topic today. Good morning. So hope that you are joining me today. This is, I think, our third, maybe fourth live. I've lost track already. Um, and today I wanted to start off just introducing myself a little bit because I've realized that I've been talking, which I do a lot, and um, some of you may not know what it is that I do. Um, so I wanted to just do a quick uh, introduction of myself. I'm Stacey Gordon. Uh, you can see that there in the screen. And I am a DEI strategist. And that might not mean anything to some of you. But DEI is diversity, equity and inclusion. You might see people who say diversity and inclusion, D and I. Um, and so uh, you also see dibs, diversity, inclusion and belonging. Um, these are all things that fall under the umbrella of diversity and inclusion. And been doing this work for quite a while. I actually started off working as a recruiter and I always worked as a you know diversity recruiter. And I use quotes when I say that because um, anyone who's ever taken a training with me knows that I tell recruiters that there's no such thing as diversity recruiting. There's just good recruiting. If you have to do diversity recruiting, it means you haven't been doing it right in the first place, right? Which is probably accurate. And it's why we are doing so many workshops around um, how to embed diversity inclusion um, into the recruiting process. A lot of what we're doing as well is DEI strategy uh, for organizations. They want to know where to start. They want to know how to start. Um, some companies haven't quite figured out why they should start. And so I thought that would be an interesting topic today because a lot of you have probably watched um, the Unconscious Bias course, which is where you may have seen me. And so, if you have not watched the Unconscious Bias course, I'm going to drop it in the uh, chat here. I can grab a link to it uh, because I think it's a really good intro to Unconscious Bias. And what I do find is that a lot of people will watch the Unconscious Bias course and then they will send me a message and they'll say, well, Stacy, I just I don't see bias. Um, I actually. <laughs> I had one lady send me a message and she said, I liked your course. She said, but I just don't understand. I have to disagree with you about your comments around um, blonde women uh, having more opportunities than brunette women. And so I explained to her and I said, you know, I didn't necessarily, and I hope I didn't, you know, because I did do this course a while ago to go back and look at, did I specifically say that brunettes have less opportunity than blondes. No. And I think I said this last week, right? We're not in the diversity Olympics. Um, it's not about who has less or more opportunity. It is about how certain traits that we have are impacted um, or are viewed by others and how that impacts us, right? So if we think about bias, um, you know, it's a, it's a broad term, right? The attitudes, the stereotypes that affect our views about social groups. So when we talk about unconscious bias, or you might hear the term implicit bias, right? It's the attitudes, the stereotypes that we're unaware of that affect our views, our actions, and our decision-making ability. And that's the biggest piece, right? Is how it affects our decision-making ability because within organizations, the people who make the decisions if they have bias, they are making decisions that are going to affect people like me, right? People like you. Um, and where it comes into play, for example, if I go back to our brunette blonde example, of course we've heard blonde jokes, right? That's not something that blonde women are a fan of, right? And so does that mean though that, I think what I'm saying is that there are always ways, people are always going to discriminate, right? They're always going to find 
bias. And so there's always going to be a way, like we, we're always trying to rank people and we have our own perspectives of what that ranking should look like. So if you are a person that has always lived in one neighborhood and you've always been around the same group of people, your perspective is going to be very different than somebody else's perspective. And I think what I'm trying to get across, and I've been trying to do for a long time, is get individuals to understand that the lens through which you see the world is the lens through which you see the world. It is not the lens through which other people see the, the, the world. So if you think about that for a minute, what that means is you have no idea what it means for me to walk through the world and to be discriminated against or to be um, refused an opportunity based solely on the fact that I am a black female, right? So it is very difficult for somebody who has never had that experience to understand it because at, at our base, we're like, why would anyone do that, right? Why would anyone look at me and go, I'm not gonna hire you because you're black. But nobody, nobody really, there are people who do that, right? And that's the conscious bias, because I also get emails about that. They're like, well, what about conscious bias? Conscious bias, yes, that, of course that's out there. Um, but conscious bias is usually, it's overt, right? It's in your face. It's a lot easier to identify. The problem with unconscious bias is we do these things without thinking. And that's the problem. So, um, you know, I'll use an example. <laughs> I've, I've had many jobs in my life um, and for a while I worked in real estate and I will never forget that when I was working in real estate, of course, you always want to make sure you're dressed well because, you know, you are going out, you're talking to people, right? But I always made sure I was in a suit, always, especially if I was doing an open house um, and depending upon the neighborhood that I was doing the open house in, I knew it was going to be potentially difficult um, because the neighborhood would be mostly white. And it's really interesting because I remember one time I had the keys, keys, right, are in my hand to, it's a gated uh, apartment complex, cond condominium complex. And I had the keys in my hand, but I was struggling because it had one of those really heavy iron doors. And in my hand, I'm holding a real estate flag. I'm holding, you know, um, one of those, um, what do you call those? Those A-frame signs, right? I'm holding a lockbox and I've got flyers in my hand. And, you know, I probably should have done two or three trips, right? But I was trying to do it all at once. So I had all this stuff in my hand and I'm trying to get through the door with the key. And this lady comes through the door. She could have held the door open for me. She looks at me and closes the door. And I was like, seriously? Did you just, wow, right? But in her mind, I couldn't possibly be going through that door because she was in, must be was expecting that I was waiting for someone to come down and let me in and she wasn't going to let me in, even though I'm standing there with keys in my hand, right, to this door. So you might think, oh, that's crazy. So this is what happens, right? I tell that story and you'll have a group of people who'll say, oh, well, maybe she just misunderstood or maybe she just didn't see you or may, like come up with a million different excuses as to why she closed the door in my face as I'm trying to go through it, right? <laughs> and if you look, you can Google, there are so many stories of people who live in their own home being accosted by people on the street, white women usually telling them that you don't live here. This isn't your house. Really? Right? So if you think about this for a minute, why are they doing that? Because their perspective is such that their neighborhood is a neighborhood of white people and there couldn't possibly be a black person in that neighborhood. And so Anything else, any facts, anything else that you give them to the contrary is, doesn't make sense to them. Like it's like a computer, does not compute, right? So it may seem crazy to us, it is crazy, right? But for those individuals, their perspective is so narrow, is so small that they cannot see anything outside of that tiny perspective. So how do we combat that? What do we do? So I've talked about this before as well. We, I do um, a much longer version of 
the in-group, out-group exercise, right? And so I challenge all of you to look at the people. I'll just use one example. If you think about, can't be family members, right? But if you take a piece of paper and write down the names of five individuals who you would go to for advice or who you trust the most, right? Write those five names down and then look at them and see with regard to gender or gender identity, race, ethnicity, uh, ability, um, with regard to social class, um, and what other factors can we put in there? Um, I think those are the main ones. Age, age, add age, right? Look at that list of people and ask yourself, do they all have the same characteristics? Are they all white? Are they all black? Are they all in the same age range? Do they all live in the same geographic community? Um, do they all have the same religion and beliefs? And so the goal is you cannot possibly have a different perspective if everyone else around you has the same perspective as you, right? That's how we get into these bubbles. So the goal is for you, once you've done this exercise, to then start to add people into your network who are different than what is on that piece of paper. Because what that does is it allows you to get gain perspective, right? So one of the things I watched, I don't know how many of you have watched the Chelsea Handler, um, I forgot what it's called. I think it's, um, oh, Hello Privilege, It's Me, Chelsea, right? So I watched this, I don't know what to call it, it's not a documentary, this, thing, program <laughs> on Netflix. And I challenge you all to watch it and see if you're as horrified as I am. <laughs> because there were so many pieces in there where you just want to shake her and go, what? Are you kidding me right now? And there were some USC students actually in there who kind of wanted to do that. Um, and the, the thing that really, really struck me about that program was that years later, right? So apparently, I'm doing spoilers here because I'm hoping you've watched it. And if you haven't, it's, it's fine. You, you, you don't, you won't mind the spoilers. <laughs> so she, uh, apparently when she was a teenager, she was kind of a wild child and she was uh, running around with a boyfriend who was um, a, like a, a, a mini drug dealer. He, he had some you know, he was dealing like marijuana or whatever, you know, things that people are in jail for life for right now, by the way. Um, <laughs> and so she, they get stopped by the police and the police um, send her home, tell her, what are you doing out here? You need to go home, right? And it's not until now in her forties that she looked back and she realized she didn't get arrested because she was white. It took her, I think she was 16 at the time, it took her all of these years to realize that her privilege stopped her from getting arrested. And it's just eye-opening to listen to her talk about this. And then she goes back to the, the guy's house and is talking to their parents. I don't know why they let her in. Um, <laughs> but uh, I just, uh, I was kind of appalled by that whole conversation that they were having. But again, my, my bias, my judgment, I won't put that on all of you, but I do think it's it's interesting to see that. Um, so I know that the change in perspective can sound really simplistic, right? Um, but it's really necessary. And I'll, I'll give you a link to Tim Wise. So if any of you have not heard of Tim Wise, you should. He is um, He's really great because he has been um, combating racism for over 25 years. And I'm gonna post a clip uh, to his, it's a portion of a lecture that he gives about race, about the, the origin of race. And so many people do not understand this concept. And so he gets a little fiery. Um, it's only three minutes. I challenge you all to watch it. I've just posted the link to it. Um, and it's really, I think it's really important that you take a look because he really talks about the origin of race and the fact that race is a social construct. And so that alone will help you to get a little bit of perspective um, around what 
we're dealing with within this country and not just the country, but the world right now. Right. So I think that that will be like, again, again, I challenge you to watch it. It's three minutes. Take a moment to, to do that. You can do it right after we're done with the live today um, because it will really be eye opening. And there is actually it's a clip of um, his whole um, lecture. I believe his whole lecture is on YouTube. He's, you know, if you search, you can find lots of great stuff that he has put out. Um, and so I recommend that you take a look at that. The other thing we can do is, you know, how do we become anti-racist? Um, you know, we've created a course, um, that really is, it's difficult conversations about race and gender. It's really very simple. It's very, um, uh, base level, but it helps you to get introspective because what we find is that a lot of individuals are struggling right now, right? They don't want to publicly admit that they don't know some of these things. And so having these, um, going through this course will help you to journal. It'll help you to just walk through some concepts. Um, and you can do it by yourself, right? It's a self-study. You don't have to, you know, talk to anybody else. It's, you don't have to get into a group setting and divulge your feelings. So um, I think that that's something that might be helpful um, for those that are looking for, for information on how they can start to, to unbias their behavior, right? Um, I see there's a question about the, the, the name of the, uh, Tim Wise is the name of the person that I mentioned. Um, if you Google him, it's uh, Tim W I S E. And actually, as I say that, I'm like, is that really his last name? <laughs> Cause he is a very wise guy. Um, and so I think that that's a, it, it, taking a look at some of these concepts will be helpful. So I want to go back to the unconscious bias course for a moment, because I would like to just mention the scope. If you think about the fact that I put that course out, I want to say it was 2017. So it's been about three years. In three years, 89,000 individual people watched that course, about 89,000, 90,000, let's say. And so that's great, right? You think, wow, that's, you know, really making an impact. I want you to realize that in 45 days, 45 days, 25,000 individuals have watched the unconscious bias course. So that shows the scope right now and the impact and just how much attention is on what needs to happen right now within our society. So again, if you haven't watched the um, unconscious bias course, take a look because it's free, it's available, and it, you should share it with your teams because when do you get free stuff, right? Uh, because yes, the course that I did post about um, uh, difficult conversations about race and gender, that one is not free. It's only $99, but it's not free. So, um, but I do encourage you to go through it because um, it's incredible value for the money. Um, we really put it out there at a price point that barely covers the cost of actually um, the, the program, the um, platform that we hosted on. So. It's just there because we want to be able to give people resources and have information at their fingertips. I do think that, um, you know, as we talk about, like I said, it's about the perspective change. So I challenge you, like, I'm going to try to do these and give a challenge. And I really think it's important for you to work with your teams, uh, to work with your cohort if you are in school right now, although it is summertime, so many of you might not be. Um, but if you're going to be going into, you know, classes in the fall, if you're going to be teaching in the fall, um, a big piece of this is educators, right? It's educators making sure that the individuals in their classroom are not being um, discriminated against or that there's bias being perpetuated, right? <coughs> Excuse me. And what I've seen is there are so many stories from people who are experiencing just really awful things that we can we can stop these things from happening. So I think that's my challenge. Like I wanted to just talk a little bit about bias today. Um, and I also want to mention I am doing um, an inclusive workplace culture 
specialty credential course through SHRM, um, and it's being offered uh, by PIRA, which is Professionals and Human Resources Association. So I could drop a link for that as well, because right now my goal is just every which way that I can hit individuals um, and help them to reduce bias, remove barriers to entry, uh, improve their trust and um, team dynamics within organizations to make your workplace more inclusive, right? That's the goal. And so one action, if you can do one action every day, heck, at this point, one action a week, right? Something really small, saying hello to somebody new, um, bringing somebody into your circle, looking at your process within your organization and asking uh, how can we improve it, right? What, where are the pieces? Like where do, where does bias come in? And I'll give you an example of where bias can come in. So I think one of the big pieces uh, we always talk about in recruitment is around hiring um, for, you know, and looking at um, education, right? There's, there has been a bit of a movement uh, for companies to stop requiring a four-year degree but I think it's not even about not requiring a four-year degree. It's really about aligning the skills uh, for the job, right? Not every job requires a four-year degree, but some do. Um, and so as we look at the, the schools that you are recruiting from, we've really got to begin to expand the network there. So that's another place where you can expand outside of your normal comfort zone, because I don't know how many universities there are in, in just in the United States, right? And if you look at the number of universities that you recruit from, it's really low. It's, it's minuscule. Um, and so that would be another challenge is that if you are in the position, if you're a hiring manager and you're in the position to look at resumes from individuals, I challenge you to stop making the university name a requirement. You can make a degree the requirement, right? But not where they uh, acquired the degree from. So that would be the, the corporate challenge. Personal challenge is to you know, open up your own network. My corporate challenge to you is going to be open up your um, requirements in terms of, because at this point is, isn't even a re really a requirement, right? If your requirement is a four-year degree, where they got it from shouldn't matter as much. And I, I get it. There are ranks of universities, but that's also a social construct that I'm not even going to try to unpack today, <laughs> which is inherently biased as well. So that would be um, a piece for you to look at is like, let's just open that up. So if you can do those two things, that alone is gonna be huge, be really huge. So uh, thank you all, appreciate you joining me today. I love that we get so many people from all around the world that, that dial in, it's one of the reasons I do this early because it gives the opportunity. Um, I've been talking to a lot of people in the UK, in Israel, um, I've talked to someone in Spain yesterday. And so it's just all around the world, there is a focus and you really want to be somebody that is helping to move your organization forward, not somebody who is standing in the way of progress. So on that note, I'm going to sign off and um, wish you all a wonderful day and uh, rest of your week.